Let's draw a diagram that helps our understanding of the compartmentalization of body fluids. And this diagram will also help us explain some of the physiological processes that depend on the way that body fluids are compartmentalized. So as you probably know, as we've looked at in other videos in this series, we can have a capillary, which is a tube of squamous endothelial cells. So this would be a systemic capillary in the systemic circulation. The cells are flattened squamous shaped cells. And the capillary, of course, is a tube. It's a very narrow tube, maybe only seven, eight microns, micrometers in diameter. And we know that in some of the small capillaries, the red blood cells only go through one at a time. So here we see some red cells going through the capillary. And as you know, the red cells are biconcaved discs. Darker on the outside, lighter on the inside. And we notice the small gaps between the individual endothelial cells. Now what this capillary is doing is it's perfusing a tissue and a tissue is a group of similar cells with associated extracellular material. So here we have the cells comprising the tissue now if we start thinking about the the blood we've already noted it's got red cells in it but it's also got plasma and the plasma consists of water molecules of course in fact in the plasma there's going to be about in this young man that we're talking about there's going to be about three liters of water now there's probably about five liters of blood altogether but two liters of that is going to be the red cells so the plasma is going to contain about three liters of water but the plasma also contains large protein molecules mostly albumin but other plasma proteins as well so the plasma is plasma proteins and water molecules now you know that blood is going to enter a capillary from an arteriole and drain into a venule arteries have higher blood pressures than veins so the blood entering the capillary from the arteriole is going to be about 32 millimeters of mercury by the time it leaves into the venule at the venous end of the capillary that's dropped to about 12 millimeters of mercury so we see that the hydrostatic pressure is going to be higher at the arterial end of the capillary compared to the venous end of the capillary and we also see that the small gaps in the endothelial cells meaning that this capillary vascular endothelial membrane is a semi-permeable membrane now a semi-permeable membrane will allow some materials to pass but not other materials to pass and in the case of this semi-permeable membrane, the higher hydrostatic pressure means that water molecules can get out. And that's good because it's the water molecules that form the tissue fluid in the interstitial compartment. So here we see we have three litres of water in the intravascular compartment. At any one time, in this fit, lean young man, we're going to have about 11 litres of water in the interstitial compartment. Of course, most of the body water is in the intracellular compartment, maybe 28 litres of water in the trillions of cells of the body in the intracellular compartment. 
So this diagram actually shows the compartmentalization of body fluids quite nicely. We've got the intracellular fluid, and then the extracellular fluid we see consists of the interstitial fluid and the plasma, the intravascular fluid. So intravascular compartment, interstitial compartment, intracellular compartment. And we've noted that because the hydrostatic pressure here is relatively high, that water molecules are going to be forced out, forming the tissue fluid. Which of course is essential that we have this tissue fluid. It's the essential diffusional medium. Because if the oxygen is going to get from the red cells to the tissue cells, it's got to diffuse from the red cell through the vascular endothelial capillary membrane into the tissue fluid in the interstitial compartment because it has to diffuse through this fluid to get to the cells. The tissue fluid is the essential diffusional medium. And of course it's the same for carbon dioxide generated here, it has to get back as well. Now, we've noted that there's large plasma proteins present in the plasma. And these generate an osmotic pressure. And the amount of pressure generated by these large plasma proteins is about 25 millimetres of mercury. But of course, this is pressure sucking back in. So here we've got 32 millimetres of mercury pushing out which is greater than the 25 osmotically sucking back in. So this means that at the arterial end of the capillary, tissue fluid is going to be formed because the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure. But by the time we get to the venous end of the capillary, when the hydrostatic pressure is lower, and now we see that the hydrostatic pressure is down to about 12 millimetres of mercury, what we see now is that the osmotic pressure at 25 millimetres of mercury is greater than the hydrostatic pressure at 12 millimetres of mercury. This means there's more osmotic pressure sucking back in than there is hydrostatic pressure pushing out. And this means that the tissue fluid will be reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. And this is good because it means we get a microcirculation of tissue fluid. Tissue fluid formed at the arterial end of the capillary, circulating through the tissues, being reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary, meaning we get a circulation of fluid through the interstitial spaces, bathing the cells, keeping the cells moist. So this diagram quite nicely shows us the intravascular compartment, the interstitial compartment, and the intercellular compartment, the compartment inside the body cells. Compartmentalization of body fluids in this tissue.